right? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Tap, tap, tap. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I know you have better things to do, like get drunk at the company's expense and stuff like that. So we really appreciate you coming in. So as usual, if you feel like tweeting, there's no coverage and there's uh, no Wi-Fi. So if you feel like tweeting, please write it down. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, when you're going on your way home or, or drinking or anything, if you think it's a good idea, just tweet it. So you can use hashtag London DevOps uh, for that. So we can track you, so we know who you are. Uh, we have a code of conduct, as um, most meetups do, and conferences have that. It's, it's very much compulsory. We stole this one uh, from the Geek Feminism Wikia, uh, which I think this one I can really back. Uh, I think it's a very good idea. I really, really like it. But I mean, for people like me, TLD, TLDR, it's too long. So basically, yeah, please just be nice to one another, yeah? Is that joke wearing thin yet? Yeah, it is. We'll take that slide out. So. Yeah. So look at the person on your left and on your right. Introduce yourself. Be nice. Yeah. So we are the ones who uh, dedicate a bit of our time uh, to try to get the speakers. And then from time to time, we lucky and get a venue like this one, which is amazing, by the way. So that's a uh, guy on the left. It's me. Uh, you won't see me on a tie and often. So get, just forget that image. Uh, then Mr. Saunders here. Yeah, I used to wear t-shirts as well. Yeah, he normally wears t-shirts. He, he just went up for this one. You even tucked the shirt in. Yeah, Mireya, who's just sitting here in front. Hello, Mireya. And Jack, who's somewhere running. He's over here. Hey, Jack. Uh, so we are the four guys running uh, the meetup, trying to get people to talk and uh, trying to shine them off and And get good venues. Yeah. So, uh, we wouldn't be here without the sponsors who pay for nice things as pizza and nicer things as alcohol. Um, so the first or oh, main sponsor is uh, Yonder and Beyond and Prism Digital. So is, raise your hands if you work for any of these two companies, please. So after, these, uh, after the meetup, just go, <coughs> say hi to them, talk with them. They're nice people. They won't bite. So also we, we are sponsored by Continue just because Matt works there. But that's, that's a small detail. So yeah, want any help with any of that sort of stuff? Hit me up later. Yes. Or if you want to work with me. Which so, DevOps Consultancy. So, very Shut agile. Up. Much configuration management. So code. Much continuous delivery. Continuous integration. Continuous delivery. Jenkins. To the top. And we're also sponsored by O'Reilly, who graciously give us books to give away, because it looks like they like doing books. Um, today we have High Performance Browser Networking by Ilya Grigorich. So, uh, raise your hand if you've seen Ilya talk. Isn't he amazing? Yeah. He's an amazing guy. So the book is as interesting as his talks. It's a very good book. And we'll have a quiz later to, the, to decide who, who gets this. We also are sponsored by DevOps guys, who are also DevOps consultancy, uh, as container. Uh, nothing to say about that, Matt. They're a great consultancy. How can you possibly say anything else? And we're also sponsored by GitHub. So you know that place where you put your code and suddenly everyone sees all your passwords on the internet. <laughs> so for these uh, four months, we're also sponsored by SoftLayer. Um, I've used SoftLayer in the past as well. Uh, in a previous company that I was working in with a guy named John, who's around here. John, where are you? Hey, Mark. There you go. Hey, John. Hi, Mark. Um, they're very good. Uh, they do, they, you want cloud, they do cloud. You want physical service, they do that as well. Uh, so they're very nice, very responsive. So I can highly recommend them personally. And today we are gracious to hear uh, due to SenseBreeze. Uh, so I would like to invite Mike to give a chat about what SenseBreeze is doing and give him a very, very warm welcome. Hi. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk for very long. All I'm going to say is that um, as the lack of Wi-Fi may sort of like give the game away, all this is quite new to Sainsbury's. We've embarked on a, a very ambitious agile transformation program. And key to this is DevOps. And key to why you're all here is because we'd like to actually embrace the community and to work with you guys to, to show the cool stuff that, that we're doing 
Um, we'd like to talk one day about the cool stuff that we want to do, but there's so much of that is unbelievable. You cannot actually imagine the scale of challenges and interesting engineering work that we, we have out, um, or problems that, we, you know, that we, we can solve. So what we want to do actually is to embrace the community, give something back, and this hopefully will be one of uh, the first of many sort of uh, meetups that we're going to put on here, not just in DevOps, but also in the developer community as well. I'm building DevOps teams here in London and in Coventry, and, and the teams that, that I'm building, we're going to also give back to the community in terms of open source projects. So it's a radical transformation for Sainsbury's, which is a FTSE 100 traditional 20th century ITIL driven company that's going for this transformation and putting in agile, DevOps, and really cool stuff. So really what I'd like to say, if you see anyone around that's got a, la a lanyard, and hands up here, see who works for Sainsbury's now? So after the, uh, after the talks, when you're having a new beer with your pizza, grab one of these guys and girls and actually talk about what we're doing in Sainsbury's because I think you'll be really you know, impressed with our aspirations and, and, and the stuff that we really want to do. So all I can say is that Sainsbury's is really a great place to work, even in the open source and agile communities. Uh, so I'm not going to say any more. Enjoy the talks. They're fantastic. Uh, we've got a, a great talk from uh, one of our guys, Wojtek, about doing continuous... Uh, uh, delivery. Um, so this is actual stuff that we actually do, um, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll see you again here very soon. So enjoy. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Okay. So um, yeah, Mike said a lot about community. You know, we're very fond of the community because, well, that's basically why most of us are here. A um, few got upcoming meetups to talk about. Um, there's an Ubuntu meetup on the 8th. Is that at Canonical, Mark? Yeah, that's at Canonical, and that's the first one, actually. Great it, views over the river, right? Yeah, it's in the Bluefin building next to the Tate Modern. So then if you can split time, use a Picard maneuver or something, you can also go to London Web Perth, Perry Doubles meetup, meetup at the Financial Times on the 8th. That's, that's tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, it's both them at the same time. Considering that it's Christmas, the meetups are all coming in anger in these yeah. first two weeks. Uh, go London User Group uh, on Wednesday over at U-Switch down in Southwark. Um, it's also on in the London Microservices into the new year up at uh, Codenode. That should be a good big meetup as well. Um, there's a docs lawn on as well yeah. this month, Have I think. Have they announced yet? But, uh, has it been announced? Anyone know? Docs lawn? Not sure. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, conferences, uh, FOSDEM over in Brussels, um, end of January, um, always a good open source conference, I'm sure. Who's been to FOSDEM? Everyone been to FOSDEM? Yeah. And then Config Management Camp the, the, the couple of days after that. So if you fancy a good old blast for um, you know, four days over in Belgium, um, two different locations, but still. Um, those are the ones to go to. Okay, so on to today's talks. Um, so we've got Wojtek from Sainsbury's, um, who's going to talk us through Project Smart Shop and continuous deployment work that they've been doing around that. Uh, and then after that, we've got some guy called Mark Cluett, um, who's going to do a, 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 a talk about service discovery and Puppet. Um, so without further ado, we're not going to do the quiz yet. Um, <laughs> we shall um, get Wojtek going. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Hi. Thanks, Mark. Um, right. <clears throat> um, the talk is going to be about continuous delivery in Smart Shop. But before I start, <clears throat> um, raise your hands if you using or have been using Amazon. Cool. So um, for those who don't use IWS, um, a auto scaling group is a. You can think about it as a daemon that will make sure that a number of servers are up and running. Um, and it will be important later on. Um, who is using Go CD? Very few hands. Shame on you. Um, so Go CD is, is a really, really powerful tool for continuous delivery. It's, it, you cannot compare it to Jenkins. There are two different things. Jenkins is for running tasks. GoCD is built for running pipelines. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's enough said. It's really, really powerful. Like, if you've got some spare time, check it out, install it, play with it. Um, 
Who's heard about Ansible? Yeah, good job. Um, so yeah, we're using Ansible for Smart Shop. And we're using um, Elastic software for, for Elk Stack. Um, who's familiar with Elk Stack? Right, for those who didn't raise their hands, it's a free solution for, and ELK stands for Elastic, Logstash, and Kibana, which gives you a nice free platform for gathering your logs, querying your logs, visualizing your logs, and so on and so on. Really, really powerful, free, and it's, it's just awesome. Um, cool, so let's begin. Um, my name is Wojtek, <coughs> and most days I'm a creative pragmatic engineer. Um, most days. <laughs> Um, and if you want to contact me, feel free to contact me at this email address. Um, cool, so the background. So what is SmartShop? So SmartShop is, is an application, a mobile application, that you can install. And in selected shops, you will be able to just log in, start scanning items in the shop, um, and then just pay on the phone and walk out. That's it, simple as that. Um, so it's, it's right now in the trial mode, but I think it will be rolling out next year uh, to a wider audience. So it's, it's really, really powerful that the idea itself is great. You know, lunch time, scan, 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 pay, walk away. So no queues, no, n no nothing. Um, at the back of this, we've, we've sort of started with nine microservices written in three different languages, PHP, Golang, and Python. Uh, right now, we've got three API consumers, so um, an Android, iOS, and Windows. Um, and we got a deadline of, three, of six months to deliver that um, infrastructure and the code. So at the beginning, um, before we started, right, I, I said, right, what are the things that I do not want to be involved in as a DevOps? Um, and the biggest one is, of course, rollbacks. Like I don't want to hear about it, I don't want to be involved, I don't want to spend a single minute of my day doing rollbacks. Um, I also do not want to spend a single minute on releases, like I, I don't care. Um, it's not my code that is being shipped, I'm not doing the, 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 the re releases. Um, I also don't want to be responsible for application configuration, so PHP, any um, Golang environments, all that, I, I'm not writing the code. Why should I care about this? Um, and of course, I don't want to be logging into production servers and grabbing for logs. That's just boring. Um, and yeah, all other boring stuff, like I, I do not want to be doing this. Because um, at the end of the day, I just want to you know, go to work and be happy. So what we did want to do so the first, the first main thing is we trust our developers. And that's, that's the key, key part of the whole Smart Shop project. Um, we do trust them. They know what they're doing. They know how to configure and run the software they, they, they are writing. Um, and developers own the service from the local VM to the production machine. Uh, they know how to write back. They know how to release, and so on and so on. Um, identical environments, that's, that's the key. Um, our microservices have no way of finding out if they're running on dev, production, staging. No way. Um, there's physically, physically no way of find out a, I don't know, a spoof IP address or check DNS. That they're all identical. Um, We've got immutable non-state services. That's, 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 that's the another sort of important part of, of the whole infrastructure. If a microservice or a box goes, have, has some problems or errors, we don't spend time on logging in, checking the logs. We just kill the box, simple as that. Um, and stack per microservice. So IWS stacks are a key part of our infrastructure. Each microservice has its own stack. If something really, really bad happens to that stack, we just kill the stack and bring up new one. Um, simple as that. It didn't happen yet on production, but if, if it would happen, we can just kill it off, start new one in 10, five, 10 15 minutes tops. Um, frequent and atomic re 
um, re releases. Uh, again, that's that's something that was quite simple and obvious. We don't want to have a hundreds of or thousands of, of lines of code being released in a, in a day. Um, Atomic, we've we we've asked our developers to make sure that each pull request, each feature is squashed to a single commit. Um, and that benefits both us and them. Uh, them, they can, if there is a bug in it, they can just see the whole image of that change, not a change called readme or fix tests or whatever. They've got the full image of the actual feature that went live. They can roll it back, they can roll forward, they can do whatever they want with it. And we can use it to present nice dashboards um, and help them to understand which feature is deployed to which environment. Uh, code as an infrastructure deployment and rollbacks. So every time we do the deployment, we don't deploy code. We deploy a microservice, like the, the whole thing, load balances, um, security groups, auto-scaling configurations, all of it. We just, just ship it all together and we can roll it back all, all together. And the auto healing, that's, that's, that's the thing I've mentioned um, on the previous slide. Every time something goes wrong with a box, we don't care, we, we just kill the box and next two minutes a new one starts up. And as a DevOps, the only thing I do want to own is the tools. And just give the tools to developers, to product owners and let them drive the product. That's, that's what I want to do. Cool, some quick stats. So, um, we're continuously building and continuously releasing. And in last, starts from last three, last three weeks, uh, 218 um, new stacks, new deployments, new virtual machines being built and shipped to dev environment. Week before that, 175. Week, week before that, one, 150. A fraction of those dev um, machines, dev, dev snapshots of both code, VMs, and infrastructure gets pushed by developers to staging environment, um, uh, roughly 30 per week. Um, and then again, a fraction of this is good enough for product, product owners, QAs, and so on and so on to push it to, to production. And again, roughly 12 a week. Um, and again, all that happens without me. Like, I don't even know about it. All I see is a release email every now and then, and that's all, and it's great. Um, the tools I've mentioned that we've, <coughs> that we've um, built for, for, for our developers um, looks like that, and that's, that's one of them. So this is, a, one of the micro, this is a fragment of a dashboard with um, one, of the m one of the microservices, and it just shows you the pull requests for that, for, for that microservice, a commit that is on dev environment but not pushed to staging yet, and then a commit that is on staging but not yet to, to, to production. And that gives developers a quick overview of right. Every single morning on during stand-up will go from right to left and then just it's going to go to that guy and say, right, what can you do to push it to production today? Do you have to speak to product owner? Do you have to speak to QA? Yes, no. Make a decision and push it to production. And then you'll, that slot is then available for this guy to push his code to staging, go through the changes with QA, with product owner, and push it, push it to production, maybe even the same day. Um, and again, it's not us pushing for it. We just gave, we, we gave them the tools um, so they can, they can visualize what's going on, how to push it, and just do it quickly. Um, we're also using Datadog. So Datadog is really, really simple. Um, uh, oh, sorry, that's Elk. <laughs> um, so again, Elk gives us a lot of stats. Um, you can do crazy stuff with it. Um, so we can monitor the um, logins to the actual stores, um, the response times, yada, 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 all, all the nice things that you can put on, on a graph. Uh, we also use Datadog um, because it's simple. Um, we really don't have to think about it. It's, it's, it's there um, reporting for us. And a question for 10 points. Um, can you spot a Black Friday? 
yeah, it's over there, yeah. That little, that's, that's Black Friday midnight, and then Black Friday 8 a.m. next day. Um, so yeah, again, out of the box, very, very simple, very, very um, easy. Um, another dashboard, just a health checks across test, dev, prod, and dev staging, and prod. Um, the hard monitor is, is red because it's not deployed yet. It's, it, they've, they've been just building a new service that, and I just snapshot how it looks if, when there is a, a service pushed to dev but not, doesn't exist on um, any other environment. Cool, tools. Um, and um, IWS. So everything is based on stacks. Um, and simply because each stack can be just replaced and rebuilt and updated on its own. So at the, at the sort of bottom, the foundation of, of, of our environment is a VPC stack, which gives us um, subnets, uh, VPC, internet gateways, all the basic stuff. And then on top of that, we build small um, stacks for VPN and, and SSH, NAT boxes, data stores, ELK, Route 53. And of course, the microservices. So every, every, when we deploy, we deploy this stack. Um, and each stack will contain a security group, auth scaling, um, some alarms, um, scaling policies, DNS records, internal or public um, ELBs, and so on and so on. Again, every stack is a little bit different, but roughly speaking, everyone should contain something like that. So that's the environment. Um, and again, the nice thing is about it, if, if one of them will die, it will not affect any other stack. Um, so there, there are no dependencies between them, and each stack can be killed and brought up again. And it takes literally 15 minutes maximum. Um, Ansible, so we use Ansible for everything. Um, we use Ansible for building our, Im our images, our servers, well, not servers, our containers. And we can, we use the same, the same playbooks to build a Vagrant, a Vagrant box or EC2 box and or Docker, Docker, or Docker box uh, container, uh, which, which we don't deploy right now. But again, it's the, <coughs> that gives developers a way to build production like VM. Um, they know exactly how the application is being run. They know exactly where the logs are, yada, yada, yada. So when they actually log into a, a staging or, or, or production box, it looks identical. It looks as their own local VM that they've been playing with day in, day out for the last six months. So they exactly what to do, where to go, what to restart, and, and so on and so on. So that's a that's big win. Um, again, an Ansible is then used for deployments them itself, for, for maintenance, so all the MySQL snapshots, um, uploading SSH keys, all this boring stuff. And of course, platform provisioning. Um, so when we, when, we when we need a new environment, it's not fully automated. You, you don't want to automate a MySQL stack updates or, or, or um, rollbacks, because yeah, that, that can end up really, really bad. So these, these things are sort of kept separately from, from the pipeline. And the Go CD. So Go CD is in the heart of the, the, of the whole pipeline. And if I will have one, um, one advice to give about Go CD is have a good read on the first um, in the in introduction on GoCD and then use templates. Like really, use the templates. They, they are so, so powerful and then, then, then will make your life very, very simple. Um, GoCD itself in, in sort of setup or the infrastructure is very similar to every um, CI, <coughs> CD tool. You've got agents, you can tell which agents has a PHP resource, which agent has a Java resource and so on and so on. You can group pipelines, um, so you can just make it easy to search or look for a particular pipeline. 
and you've got something called environment in GoCD, which allows you to allocate a, a number of agents for an, an, for an environment. So let's say if you want to keep five agents only for production releases and pr production update, you can do it very, very easily just in the GoCD. So your sort of <coughs> dev and staging <coughs> pipeline can be really, really busy, but there will be always five, five of agents ready to pick up any production work. And, and all these tools together, they, they build the pipeline for developers. And it just allows them to write the code, build it, push it, all the way to production. And it, it happens, again, 12.7 a week. That's the latest stats, which gives a two deployments per day, more or less, three, let's say. Which is again awesome. Like every every developer would at least deploy once to production every every single week. Um, and this is how the pipeline looks um, in GoCD. And one thing to to sort of um, be aware of in GoCD is this was just one of of the many views of a pipeline because you can look at the same thing from, from different directions, uh, from different points of view. Um, but uh, here we've got a, a test stage, just very standard, um, which then sort of feeds in a, to a build stage. Build builds an AMI in, in IWS and save, save the AMI ID somewhere. Um, but you can see that the build, uh, build pipeline has a dependency on base image. And the base image is nothing else than a job that just base a build a vanilla Ubuntu server with some security patches and so on and so on. Um, and every time any of these two changes, it causes the rebuild of a service. Um, but if you if if you look at the pipeline from the base image build point of view, you will see something like that. So you'll, you'll see then that the build 45 of base image was used to build all these microservices. Almost all of them went to dev, apart from these two. Some of them went to staging. And one, two, three, <coughs> four went to production. So you can straight away see, OK, base image number 45, the, the, let's say the latest one, where is it? Which, which microservice is using that base image, which environment, and so on and so on. Very, very powerful. So if, if, if you know that you've got a security fix in that image, you know where it is right now. And you, you know if you have to manually patch production or not. Um, well, manually, with Ansible. Um, but yeah, that's, again, it's the same pipeline, but from a, the base image point of view. Um, after build, we just deploy to dev automatically. Um, when it's deployed to dev, developers can run in, in integration tests on dev environment. If they're green, they can push to staging. Very, very simple. When it's on staging, you can run the integration tests on staging and decide if you want to push to production. Um, and when you push to production, you want to just run the integration test on prod just in case. Um, and that's the pipeline, like really, really simple. Um, and before I gave that talk, um, I went to developers and asked them, how does it feel? Um, does, it, does it work? W would you change something? And that's the best quote I got. Um, it's the way I, I wanted to work for a long time. And that's from a developer who joined us two weeks ago. And after, I think, a week, he pushed his code to production. And he just couldn't believe it, because um, <laughs> He, he still got a some code that didn't that was not pushed yet to prod in some other projects, <coughs> but yeah, he he just loves it, and that's it. Any questions? One more. Hi, um, just wanted to ask about the persistence. So you mentioned that you have MySQL. 
Yeah. Does each microservice have their own, you know, uh, MySQL schema and how do you deal with transactions if there are intra-service? So when make microservice calls another and there's a chain of calls, how do you deal with yeah. these issues? So I don't. Well, yeah, but um, okay. so, so they, Fair enough. They, <laughs> it's developers are very, very aware that mm -hmm. what they've got, they've got our tools. If they have to do, let's say, migrations, <laughs> they know that the migrations need to be backwards and forwards com compatible. They know that if, if they don't have it, they will have to wait for 9 or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock and do it themselves manually after hours. And I will not help. Um, they've got all the tools to do it. Um, if they choose to break the, da the database, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I, I give them all the tools to prevent it, to make sure that when it goes to production, it will behave the same as it went to staging and to dev. Um, the MySQL stack itself, right now it's a single stack for all the microservices. Um, because of the load, we don't care. But going forward, there will be a, a RDS per microservice, mm -hmm. um, simply because we don't, want, we don't want one microservice to kill all the others. But right now, the, the CPU load on the My, My, MySQL is so low that it's, f it's faster for us to deliver uh, with one RDS than speeding up um, upfront. And what about um, the transactions? So imagine, you know, there's the first microservice that, um, you know, starts a transaction, but then there's another microservice starting another transaction. And so it's, I don't know. Again, that's, that's <laughs> developers. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I'm a DevOps. I don't deal with the code. I don't know how your application works. If you need to test it, we've got the, you, you can build a set of Vagon machines on your laptop, start it, and test it. Um, so you've got all the tools to build a production-like environment on your laptop and just run it and see what happens. And that's it. Okay, thank you. <coughs> yeah, there's one. Why you use the Neo4j, for example, in that place, in that place? Sorry? Second sentence. Why you use MySQL instead of Neo4j, for example? So the, the question was why MySQL? Um, simple as that, because our developers wanted to use MySQL. Simple as that. Like, it's not my project to run. It's not my, t my decision to make. If developers want to use MySQL, I will give them MySQL. If they want to use Postgres, I will give them Postgres. If, if, you, if they want to use Mongo, I will install Mongo. Um, but again, as a DevOps, I can only give them advice, but I will not force anything on them in terms of the tools to use. That's not my job. Any other questions? So have you then put your developers on call, or are there separate sysadmins? So right now, the, there is the on call doesn't exist. If a service, so the depends on what's happening. If the service stops responding on the health checks, it's being sh killed, shut down, and the new one starts up. So like if, if it runs out of disk, if it runs out of memory, it will just be shut down by AWS and the new one will, will start up. Um, if there is a problem with the code, there's nothing I can do again, and it will be, the, Again, the, the release email says exactly which developer is involved in this release. So if something happens, we check the emails and say, okay, Mr. X did the last deployment, that's his code, his change, go figure. Um, simple as that. So we don't have a 24 seven active support outside of the team. Okay, and the tooling that you're saying, such as MySQL, Mongo, whatever else is then the responsibility of, of the IWS. development team. Or IWS. So from, from the sort of ops side, that's IWS. And again, I just offload that to IWS. In terms of schema, migrations, it developers. Any other questions? One more. So I get that you handle a lot of to the developers and they do it all themselves. Who helps them with the architecture? Who helps them with making good operational decisions? Who helps them use the AWS tooling? Is that your role or do you just leave it to them to work it out themselves? No, no, yeah, so that's, that's, when, when, that, that's when we come in. So 
what's inside that, I, that AMI image. That's up to develop. That's up to developers. How it runs, how we deploy it, how we scale it up. That's for that's for us to 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 decide. So if they do something stupid. You have the power to veto them. If they do something stupid in the code, we probably won't see it. Um, and. So let's say, for example, to the earlier point, they make a microservice that depends on their other microservices. They haven't coded it to deal with the fact that it disappears when you reboot yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a thing you say, well, they've just developed their code bad? Yeah, simple. I mean, like, again, I, there is no way you will know all nine, ten mi microservices inside out. There is no way. What, what, the only thing you can do is give developers a way to reproduce a environment and just play with it. Uh, if you want to test what what happens if a box goes down, spin up two two boxes l locally, kill the one, and see what happens. Um, that's it. Last one. A couple more questions. One in the back as well. Uh, things like scaling log. Do you you said you do that? Do you choose the scaling log? Do you let the developers choose? Because sometimes like CPU might not match the request. So yeah, so we, we so the question was how we decide on how to scale up or down. Uh, we do load tests, and then based on the load test, we can see, okay, that box, that, that microservice is CPU heavy, that box is network heavy, that box is memory heavy, and then based on that, we make a, we make a decision based on our load tests. So it's, 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 it's DevOps, not Dev. Dev gives us the box, a black box with port 80 open, the rest is, is our. Re responsibility. Hi. Um, just one question. How did you um, figure out how to fix the... Um, not how to fix... How did you deal with uh, running all the microservices and uh, the rest of the infrastructure on the development machine in Vagrant? Um, as the number of services grows, you need yeah. bigger and bigger machines. So how did you solve this issue? Um, so at the beginning, uh, we had <coughs> a Vagrant VM per microservice that doesn't scale. Um, so, but because it's all sort of Ansible based, we can include multiple Ansible playbooks in a Vagrant box. So, if a service talks to five other services, a provisioning Ansible playbook for that Vagrant box will have five includes one for each mi one for each <coughs> microservice, and it will build all those microservices on that one box. Um, that's how you can sort of build five, nine, because it's, it's very, very, very rare wh where you have to all nine servers or nine microservices in one box. It's usually a subset of, let's say, five. And then we've, we've, it's, it's really, really easy to like, pick five of them and build on one single machine. OK, so you, you compute the dependencies and only start what is needed for the, the current. Yeah, yeah, OK, yeah. thank you. Just one more. Uh, what kind of uh, monitoring you use? So what monitoring tools so do you use? Da so Datadog for the service service monitoring and Elk for applications logs. I mean, no, I mean, I meant uh, all for alerting, for example, if applications. Like Datadog. So Datadog has alerts. You can alert on whatever you want, on fresh code, blah, 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 blah. <coughs> Integration with Slack, if you want as well. Very, very easy, sexy. <coughs> <laughs> okay, quick quiz. It's not the quiz you saw on the screen earlier that didn't have the picture of Tim Berners-Lee on it. Who likes cold pizza? <laughs> <laughs> One person. Okay, you stay here. I said no. <laughs> no, no, go behind you. Everyone else. Um, oh, there's Tim Berners-Lee. Should we do the quiz first, yeah? Yeah, so okay. while pizza is being delivered in an agile way, of course, um, we're going to give away this amazing book from Ilya Gagarik, thanks to O'Reilly. So you know I'm a bit of a computer history freak. So the question today is kind of hard. Not as hard as the last one, because that was too hard. <laughs> but uh, so everybody here knows who this guy is? Yes? Yeah, pretty much. He's kind of famous now. Gets all the girls and everything. Uh, so this guy is Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web as a copy of a Mac program, actually. But <laughs> um, so the question is double. So you have to tell me where he was working when he invented these, and what computer did he use? 
Okay, you first. Yes, he was working at CERN in Geneva, trying to destroy the world. <laughs> and he used an X-Cube invented by Steve Jobs. So yeah, congratulations. <laughs> okay, so you stay here, everyone else, go and get some pizza. We'll have a second talk after the pizza. Cheers. <laughs>